Did you count all the souls aboard? Did you, did you count me? There ain't never seems to be worried that I get back alive, just that all of y'all do. So I like to double check him. He's gonna be coming through. <laughs> wave that? goodbye, Bugsy, wave. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome aboard. I want to thank you, before we even get started, for joining us tonight. There is, I just told the ladies out there, there is nothing I'm doing more than coming out here in the Northern Central to tell stories about Halloween time. Now, I very probably already told you that I'm going to stop every now and again when the whistle blows because you'll never hear me with the microphone or not. Those of you like being sent to talk to when we get out of the campfire, I'll be walking around because there's no sound down there. Quiet and down, I'll be happy to sit with your group and tell stories. If you don't want to hear me, just don't make eye contact. Because you're all my victims pretty much right now. So, uh, Barry will be up and down. If you need anything, please let me know. Windows open, windows closed, and all that kind of stuff. But then right now, I know Barry spoke to you about Abraham Lincoln and how he came into Gettysburg. That's where I'm from. To deliver some appropriate remarks at the cemetery there for the men who had died, the Union men who had died during the battle of Gettysburg. Now, after Lincoln was elected for his second term, after he was assassinated, by John Wilkes Booth, Lincoln had to ride the train one last time. Now the funeral train went from Washington, D.C. Every car of the nine cars was draped in black. Black bunting on the windows, a large portrait of Abraham Lincoln was on the engine. The train rode from Washington, D.C through Maryland, up to New York, where it then proceeded to go west to Springfield, Illinois, where Lincoln was to be buried. Now, as, as things went in those days, everybody pretty much loved the president, and everywhere that Lincoln's funeral train passed, people were standing like you'll see folks tonight. You'll see him waving at you from either side of the window, so keep, uh, keep an eye out for him. The people stood while the funeral train went by. Now, there happened to be an embalmer on the train as well. The science had been pretty newly developed. There's a man, he didn't wait at us. He, uh, or was he a ghost? I don't know. Well, there was an embalmer who was on the train, and that was because every couple of days, as President Lincoln's body deteriorated, he had to keep him freshly embalmed. Now, one of Lincoln's sons, Willie, was on the train with him as well, so the embalmer was kept very busy. As the train rode by, Many people wailed and cried and wept and screamed, No, my president! No, my president! They said. And the train just lumbered slowly by. It wasn't real fast like Amtrak goes nowadays. It was a long journey. The train went all through the day and all through the night. It never stopped. And the men who worked on the tracks, who worked on the rails, why, they had to be out there night after night. No matter what the train switches or tracks or anything would need, had to be attended to. This was a very, very important train ride. Lincoln eventually made it to Springfield, Illinois, where he was buried. In the days, the weeks, the months, even the years that followed, 
railroad workers would be out at night, out on the tracks. Maybe something horribly had gone wrong and they had to come out and see what it was. And more often than not, as they worked, quietly as they could, all of a sudden, they would hear wailing. No, no, people cried. The workers looked at one another. Hey, you, shut up. That wasn't me. But the crying and the weeping continued. The workmen couldn't dare stop what they were doing and go back into their, their homes or their cars or their wagons. And so they had to stay out there on the tracks. And often it was that as they worked, when they heard the anguished cries out of the blackness, a black locomotive would appear rolling down the tracks right towards them. Now these men were out there trying to fix the tracks. They knew no train could ride over there. It would be a massive crash. Well, how many people might have been on those trains that would have lost their lives? But the sound of the train rumbling down reached their ears till it came louder than the weeping and the wailing of the women along the side of the tracks. And it was Lincoln's funeral train from out of the blackness, out of the fog, out of the rain, whatever happened to be happening at the time. And that didn't happen just once. Oh, that happened many, many times. It's been over 160 years since Abraham Lincoln's funeral train rode those rails. still happening today. This is where the roast is, Bugsy. We're going to do hot dogs here. Wave to them. Look at the fire. We go past it and then Husbands come back. Don't get upset. Where are you going to play with? I like this part. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Now I dare say you folks have heard a story. In the third grade book about ghosts, maybe you've experienced this kind of haunting for yourselves. This is a story about a young woman. She's known as the White Witch of the Woods. <laughs> oh, now you're not scared. So this is a ghost story. Right now, keep your eyes open and I'll tell you what to look for. It scared me! A long time ago, there was a young girl. For some reason, folks that lived near her, around her, in the little town. They didn't think much of her. She didn't have any friends at all. And she was never quite sure why the townsfolk were afraid of her. So one night, after she had a baby, She wandered off into the woods. She 
determined then and there that she could live like this no longer. And wearing nothing but a white nightgown, she walked towards the creek where she knew it was the deepest part. She filled the pockets of her dress with heavy stones. And she gathered up her baby. And she walked into the water. While she knew where the deepest part of the creek was, she made no plans of coming back out. With a brave face and her baby bundled up in blankets under her arms, she waded into the creek. Oh, she hardly weighed anything at all. And those heavy stones, why, they, they served their purpose. As she walked into the creek, there's the creek now. As she walked into the creek, the water rapidly rose over her head. And the young woman drowned. It sounds a horrible thing to happen to the young girl. Oh, the young girl. The townspeople didn't even really seem all that upset about it. And the years went by. Well, as you can see, this area here has gotten quite developed. We've seen roads, we've seen inns and restaurants. But there's something else people started to see. Her walking or riding down the trail. Every now and then, we would catch a glimpse of a ghostly figure of light. From head to toe, with what seemed like a bundle of rags in her arms. And she walked straight to the road. Well, you can imagine people who were riding their bikes, people who were driving their cars, when they would see this woman, not knowing anything about the story, why they'd slam on their brakes and try to stop. Tires skidding along the roads. There were many, many accidents here along the trail. Well, one night, a young man was leaving his job. He's probably a bartender, so there's no telling if this is a true story. Oh, but I would believe it if I were you. For as he was driving, he remembered all the stories about Ooh, the way with the, the thought of yes. her coming upon him. Oh, okay. Ooh, not a witch. Not a witch. The thought of happening upon her, especially at night, was extremely frightening to him. He would never tell his friends any of that. He sounded like a scaredy cat, but he was a scaredy cat. And so as he was driving along the road, he kept looking in his rear view mirror and his side view mirror and the other mirror. And every now and again, he turned his head just a little bit over his shoulder, making sure that the white witch was nowhere near the Well, it just so happened around the bend in the road, he took his eyes off the windshield for just a moment just to see if she was following him when he'd heard so many stories how she would latch on to the trunks of cars, jump into the beds of pickup trucks. And when he turned his head back to look at the street in front of him, there she was, all in white, her hair stringy and plastered to her face as though she'd been standing for a week in a rainstorm. She held a raggedy bundle of something in her arms and pond scum clung to the bottom of her skirts. She stepped right out in front of the young man. He slammed on his brakes! He was going so fast he wasn't paying attention. He lost control of his car, and he slammed into a tree. Now, fortunately, the young man was all right. 
he didn't suffer any physical injuries whatsoever. But the police had to be called to the accident scene. And when they got there, they took a statement from the young man, and he told them exactly what had happened. It was a woman, it was a woman, and, and, and she was carrying something, and, and she was all wet, and she, she came out of nowhere, I tell you, I never saw her. She wasn't there, and one second later she was. And that's how I crashed. I, I slammed on my brakes to avoid hitting her. Yeah, yeah, said the police. We've heard that kind of story before. The young man was, he was so upset. You have to believe me. A woman walked out of the woods and stood right in front of my car. Well, the police wrote him a ticket for irresponsible driving or some such thing. His truck was able to be driven home. He was still shaken up. He sat in the driver's seat and, and he watched the police officers walk away. But then, strangely, one of the policemen turned around and walked back to his truck. He bent down and he looked at the young driver. He said, son, I know those other ones don't believe you, but I do. Oh, thank goodness, said the man. The policeman said, I believe you saw the white witch of the woods. Because I saw her myself many years ago. So you keep your eyes open. She's really easy to spot when it gets real dark outside. I never to scream when I'm when I'm walking between the cars because they, the very said that makes him think I fell out. Um, so I wait until I get inside here. You're not the ones that are. Sc <laughs> Even the people who say they like getting screamed at, <clears throat> I guess they kind of don't. Now, did you guys hear me back here on this thing? Okay. Because they told me that sometimes the sound system doesn't work this far back. So I'm going to try to stay right in the middle. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'll look for some more victims down here. I don't know. Do I have some unsuspecting victims? Oh, she so drew down the river. <laughs> okay. Um, here's the best and the worst part about telling stories on the train. They tell me I can't get too scary. Now, I know they act like the kids don't want to be scared, and we all know it's the parents who don't want to be scared. Because I get in my car and go home, but your parents got to go home with you. So, I'm not allowed to be really, really scary. But you don't mind if I'm really scary, do you? You paid, you paid for these tickets, right? Oh, well, you kids didn't, but... All right, so... Oh, somebody's getting a nice new haunted house over there. Can't tell if it's going up or coming down. Okay, so... I already told you folks I'm going to be telling stories at the campfire, too. There is no sound system. So if I'm just going to walk around, and if you want me to tell you stories, just let me know. I'm happy to sit down with you and your group and share some other scary stories. If you don't want me to tell stories, don't make eye contact. Because I figure everybody wants to hear stories. Now, we just... Oh, this is such a pretty ride, isn't it? All right, let's see. What... Hmm, what stories are my victims like to hear? <laughs> um, hmm. You know what, I actually have a, I don't know that it's possible. But they make me stick to single war stories. But hey, I do have, I'm going to look that one up then. 
I do have a, I have a pretty good story. It's called Hairy Hand. Does that sound pretty good? First of all, all the littles and all the bigs can raise their hands if you like pumpkin pie. I like pumpkin pie. Oh, this is the perfect group to tell the Hairy Hand story to. Well, like I told you, I came here from Gettysburg tonight, and if you ever been over that way, up in the mountains there are two beautiful lakes, Laurel Lake and Fuller Lake. They're absolutely beautiful, swimming, boating, spring fed. It would have to be 200 degrees outside for you not to freeze in one of those lakes. Well, the lakes are part of what was once a mining operation, and every day, the miners would go out up on the mountainside with their chisels and their hammers and they would work the whole entire day hanging off the side of the mountain. They would lower themselves down on ropes and just chip, chip, chip away. Well, that's what our friend was doing when a terrible thing happened. You see, he went to work that day like he always did. And his wife would pack him a lunch pail and she would try to put, fill it with all of his favorite things. Well, one day when she kissed her husband goodbye, she said, oh sweetheart, I have a surprise for you in your lunch pail today. And he said, you do? What is it? What is it? I want to know. She said, I'm not going to tell you because you won't even make it to work. You'll just sit there and you'll eat your lunch before it's lunchtime. So it's going to be a surprise. Well, the whole way it worked, he could hardly wait to find out what the surprise was in his lunch pail. So he took himself up to the top of the mountain and he lowered himself down and he tried so hard to concentrate on his job. He just couldn't wait for that surprise in his lunchbox. Well, you might guess, is this? Okay, you might guess that he couldn't stand the suspense any longer. So when he lowered himself down that mountainside, he took a peek inside that lunch pail and my goodness, my goodness, his eyes must have been as wide as saucers because there it was. A piece of pumpkin pie. He was so excited, he was so excited, but at the same time, he almost felt like his wife must have been watching him. Oh no, she's gonna be so mad. I gotta eat this one. I gotta hurry up and work as fast as I can so I can eat my lunch. Well, that's exactly what happened. He took his good old time munching on a sandwich, an apple, or peaches, or whatever else was in his lunchbox, and then there it was. Pumpkin pie. Did I tell you how much he loved pumpkin pie? Well, he loved that pumpkin pie. So, he was all finished up with his lunch, and he reached in his lunch box, and he pulled out that beautiful, orange, smelly piece of pie. And just as he was ready to take a bite, and, no, no! He reached out, he tried to touch the pie, but the pie splashed into the lake. No more pie. There was no more pie. He was so desperate to have that pie, he wasn't paying attention to what happened. But you know what happened? He fell off the mountainside and into the lake where we drowned. Well, it was a while till anybody missed him. Finally, his wife wondered what happened. She expected him to come home with a great big kiss for her for making that delicious pumpkin pie. Only she never saw him again. 
And I told you, Laurel Lake is an absolutely beautiful place to go. And it got to the point when folks went fishing or swimming out there, they get out a little too deep when all of a sudden a hand would come out of the lake and it would scramble and scratch and try to get a hold of them. Ah, they would try, leave me alone, leave me alone. Go away. What people said, you know what they said. That was hairy hand. His big hairy hand would come out of the water and try to get something to eat, preferably pumpkin pie. But folks were very, very afraid. Now this was a Pennsylvania State Park and it still is. So folks started doing something really weird. Every year on Halloween, they would go down to Laurel Lake with their pumpkins. And they would row out to the lake. And they would drop their pumpkins into the water. Why they said it kept the hairy hand from coming out after him. But this was a man-made lake and all those pumpkins of all those years started to create quite a mess. People wouldn't give up that tradition. They would not give up that scary story about Harry here. And so the park servant came up with a really neat idea. You can do this today, won't you? You get a pumpkin. We're going to go back to the bonfire and the hot dog and the marshmallow roast. And you put a candle in it. And then you carry it down to the water's edge. And there, the park rangers put all the lighted pumpkins on a giant raft. And they tow it out into the center of the lake. And I told people, Harry Hand liked it that way. So as long as people go every year on Halloween, out to Laurel Lake, and maybe it's not always exactly on Halloween, but go to their website, DCNR Laurel Lake. There's a big festival out there. They have food trucks and tents and crafts, and it has become not so scary as it once was. But every now and then, you never know. No ghost I ever heard of went away without a sound. They tend to stick around. Whoa, I'm gonna... They tend to stick around waiting for people who just might not know the story of Harry Hand. Okay, we seem to have broken down. I think this is the part where the ghosts get on the train. So if you're, if you have space, scooch over so we can pick a few up before we head back. See you soon. Don't worry. She's telling stories. What's my name? Laura. What's your name? What is it? Okay. Her nickname is Bug or Bugsy. Oh, Bug. Her parents call her the
scared myself. All right, folks. Now, you keep a lookout as we go. And I'm, as I said earlier, and why I'm dressed like um, I'm from the Civil War era is because I live in Gettysburg, and I tell those stories in Gettysburg. I walk around the streets at night, calling 25 people around with me, sharing stories, sharing stories of what it was like for folks who lived in Gettysburg at the time of the battle. Now, everybody knows what happens in a war, and I, I would say everybody knows where ghosts come from. Somebody, yeah, somebody has to be dead before there's going to be a ghost, and so with all due respect, I do share stories of the dead at the Battle of Gettysburg. Almost 200,000 troops came that July 1st. 75,000 approximate Confederates, 95,000 Union soldiers. They marched up to Gettysburg on their own two legs, from places as far away as Texas and Alabama, Louisiana and Mississippi. From places as far away as Michigan and Maine and Connecticut. They met on what was to become the most famous Civil War battle of all, the Battle of Gettysburg. It was fought July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. They didn't come here to die. Well, they didn't go to Gettysburg to die, but die they did by the thousands. When the short three-day battle was over, more than 7,000 men and one woman lay dead on the fields and in the town. The battlefield, if you've been there, isn't just the grassy areas. It isn't just the places where you see the monuments. The battle was fought in the streets of the town. Almost every building which stood in Gettysburg at the time of the fight is still standing today. Yes, yes. Jenny Wade was the one woman who was killed during the fight. And it wasn't because she, she bound her breasts and cut her hair and looked and dressed like a man. She was actually baking bread in the kitchen of her sister's home, but she was accidentally shot by a Confederate sniper. Jenny was the only civilian who lost their life in Gettysburg. She was by no means the only one who lost their life in the days following. You see, after the battle was over, accidents began happening all over the town. Accidents that were caused by human carelessness, curiosity, or ignorance. You see, when the battle was over, the armies left in a hurry and they didn't take everything with them. And as a result, the fields and the and the yards and the streets were filled with all the detritus of the battle. Cannons, artillery wagons, human limbs hung from the tree limbs. Every weapon of destruction known to man was brought to bear at the battle that summer. And it was many, many, many months till all of the dead were removed or buried. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until the very end of October when the last of the Union soldiers were interred in the cemetery. You see, one of the tragedies of the fight was that whenever the burial parties found a Confederate soldier, they either just put him back in the hole or just left him lay where he was. I like to say the real ghosts of Gettysburg were the mothers and fathers and wives and sweethearts who came up from the South. They walked around town asking anybody that would look at them. Have you seen my Charles? Have you seen Han? Well, last I knew, they said they was coming to Gettysburg and we're here to find them. It was probably only about 10 years ago that they found more Confederate skeletons in Gettysburg. Well, when the army 
morning, yeah. Tickets, please. They took a lot of the medics with them. The so it was left up to the women in Gettysburg to work in the hospitals. They were real hospitals. They were schoolyards. And they were schools and taverns and churches. And any place. That's not yours. The German Reformed Church. That's from the other train. A young man from the 151st Pennsylvania Infantry was taken there with a slight leg wound. Only he left in the little church. No, not so much to a house of worship as to a house of horrors. The shutters and doors were laid across the tops of the pews. The doors were torn from the rooms to make shift operating tables. They said that the, the pews were so drenched and the uh, walls so scattered with it. Why? There was no cleaning on it. It had to be torn down and rebuilt. One mother to two young boys while she was pressed into service as, as a doctor's assistant. Why, well, she didn't know anything about that. She might have learned how to help deliver a baby, but she had nothing to do nursing experience. But like most of the women in Gettysburg, every single day after the battle, during and after the battle, she worked in the high street school where she was once a teacher. She worked care for the wounded there. After the fight was over, there were 22,000 wounded in Gettysburg. And the town only had 2,200 people in it. Young girls helped. Young boys helped. Well, our school teacher, every day she would go up to the, to the High Street Hospital, which cared for the wounded. She always had to leave little boys at home. She never wanted to do it, but her father was away at the fight. She didn't have anything to do with children. No babysitters around. All the women were helping in the hospitals. The one day, well, the first day, I guess, she came down from working in the hospital, and her two little boys were out front waiting for her. And she didn't tell the children to come to the town. She knew the streets were far too dangerous. But the girls thought, since they're always away at the fight, it was their job to see their mother safe home every day. And that was the sight the village had grown to love and cherish. The mother and her two young sons walking home through the war torn streets. But sadly, one day, the young nurse came outside and the children were nowhere to see. She rather thought perhaps that the neighbors were helping out that day and she set off for home, happy in her heart. At least today, she thought, at least today I know they would be safe. But that wasn't how the story ended. But earlier that day, the older of the two boys had found a rifle that had been discarded in the hasty retreat. When he was done showing the gun off to all of his friends, he brought it in his house to show his little brother and wife. I, I don't need to tell you what happened next. The young boy was three years, seven months, and one day old. By all accounts, the youngest casualty of the battle. He died and was buried on July 6, 1863, and his little tombstone is readily visible in the town. He's buried in a small cemetery, but the strangest thing is, of the 46 headstones there, men who fought in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, Spanish American War, Korean War veterans, there's only 46 headstones in this cemetery. And young Edwards is one of them. Well, the cemetery was behind the little church that was the very first one built in Gettysburg. It was the Methodist Episcopal Church. It was built in 1822, but soon the congregation outgrew the little building and they up and moved to another church, which is also still standing today.